All right, let's go ahead and, uh, and get started. I'm Josh Evans. I'm the Director of Operations Engineering at Netflix. And I'm here today to talk to you about how we at Netflix operate our global engineering or engineer our global operations in the cloud. This is a visual representation of the Netflix microservice architecture. And as you can see, it's a fairly complex thing. We have traffic coming in from the internet, and it moves through this sort of spider web of dependencies within our infrastructure. This is actually a simplified view of what we actually do. And one could argue, because of the complexity of this, especially at web scale, especially globally, that this system is more like a living organism than it is like a computer program. And just as a living organism has organ systems that collaborate to create the overall organism and um, support the health of it, um, services do the same thing. And just as organ systems can fail and they can have catastrophic impact on your overall service, uh, so can, uh, so can uh, your services here. So you can actually have an individual service that can take down your entire uh, service for your customers. Also, just like a living organism, you can have autoimmune responses. You can have retry storms. So when your services start to fail, you make problems worse with poorly tuned timeouts and retry policies. And finally, just as with a living organism, this system's constantly in flux. On any one day, we might make over 1,000 changes to this environment. So if you're responsible for the health of this kind of ecosystem, it's a pretty daunting task. It's seemingly impossible to maintain the health of this environment at large scale and still take on and absorb all the change that comes along with that. And so this is what we're, I'm here to talk to you about today. At Netflix, we have a number of strategies that we've applied to try and attack this problem space. I'm going to walk you through that now. So the, we're going to take a bit of a journey, and this is both a personal journey for me. Um, this is sort of a discovery process that I went through myself and that we at Netflix have gone through. And this will also be our journey together today in this session. So I'm going to talk about two fundamental operational challenges. And then I'm going to talk about how those two challenges come together to form our definition of operational excellence and then how we put engineering muscle behind that in order to accomplish operational excellence. And I'm going to spend the majority of the time on the operations engineering component. So let's start with those two operational challenges. So believe it or not, product innovation is an operational challenge. And at Netflix, product innovation is something that we focus on rather obsessively. And we constantly focus on winning moments of truth. We have competitors. And when our customers have leisure time, they have a lot of choices about how they're going to select their entertainment. And we obsess about acquiring those customers and making them happy, engaging them, and having them watch more hours of our service. And ultimately, if we do a great job on the product side, we'll also generate new acquisitions of customers because those happy customers will tell their friends and family and coworkers about our service. And just to give you a sense of how we've evolved over time, we're going to focus on the user interface first. And this was our previous version of the Netflix UI on 10-foot devices. These were on DTVs. And we call this our Plus UI. And it's a relatively straightforward and simple user interface. It's very similar to uh, browsing through a video store. You see rows of box shots. You can hover over one of them. You can get the back of the box information to decide whether or not you want to watch that content. And yes, there were definitely some sophisticated things happening behind the scenes around recommendations. But with this UI, we did so many A-B tests, thousands of A-B tests over a period of years. And we felt that it was necessary to make a quantum leap. We took all of those learnings, and we created what we now call our Darwin user interface. This was a real shift for us. It's much more cinematic. You can see that we have large hero box shots that promote our original content, or whatever you happen to be hovering over. You can see that we moved from horizontal, I'm sorry, from vertical to horizontal box shots. And we've experimented even with the images that show up within each one of those box shots to determine what will entice our customers to watch that content and enjoy it. We also did a large amount of tuning on our algorithms to determine what rows do we show you, what order do they come up in, 
what content goes in, how do we do deduping around those things. A lot of innovation went into this particular platform. We were very pleased with it, and it really did move the needle on some key performance metrics like customer engagement. Now, we took that win and we just applied it to our website as well. You can see the same uh, kind of interface, although adapted to the web, the video store experience with the back of the box uh, content. And we, have did, we applied all the learnings from Darwin plus all the learnings that we had on the website specifically, and we created what is now called our Akira user interface, and it has that same cinematic feel. It's got the large hero box shots, it's a one-page experience instead of having to navigate through in sort of an older school web interface, and all the information you need is at your fingertips to decide whether or not you want to watch that content. So again, this has been a huge win for us in terms of engagement. As I said, we obsess about innovation, and we do it continuously, and we do it on every single facet of our service, whether it's our adaptive streaming algorithms, personalization algorithms, the user interface, price tiering, all kinds of things. And in the last year, we did over 1,400 A-B test cells, individual experiences presented to different customers, benchmarked against a control to determine whether or not we were making that experience better for our customers. And you'll see as we move forward over the next year or two, more and more video incorporated into the user interface. Like this. Once, 10 years ago. What's the statute of limitations on that? 12 years. That's tough. And you'll see more of this embedded directly into the UI and other places. You'll see more cinematic things directly in the list of movies. And all of this actually requires growth within the infrastructure itself to support additional calls to our backing infrastructure to support all of the data that comes into the UI and the telemetry that comes back to tell us about what the customer experience actually was. So challenge number one is how do we go faster? How do we accelerate innovation and rate of change? Challenge number two is probably a little bit more expected, scale and complexity. We're a growing business. And for folks who are growing their footprint in the cloud and growing to web scale and moving to a global scale, the challenges become more and more interesting and they shift over time. To give you a sense of our scale, at peak, we're serving up thousands of starts per second. These are thousands of people, many thousands of people, all clicking play at the same time. And you can see this daily traffic shift that I'm sure for many of you is quite familiar as people wake up in the morning and start doing things, and then in the evening for us, because we're an entertainment service, you'll see it peaks in the evening. And supporting all of this is a backdrop of hundreds of thousands of requests per second to support the overall experience, whether it's data to drive the UI or telemetry that gets fed back to us so that we can diagnose and optimize the experience for our customers. So we look at this starts per second as the heartbeat for our service. And we monitor it quite closely to make sure that when we have problems with it, that we can address them quickly. We're approaching global reach. We're currently in roughly about 60 countries. We expect to be in more like 200 countries by the end of the year. Our last reported numbers around members were 65 million members, but we can see 100 million in our sites over the next few years. We've just, just launched in Japan. We're about to launch in more countries in Western Europe, and we've just announced that we're going to be launching in early 2016 in four more Asian countries. So our footprint is increasing. To support this, we have a multi-zone, multi-region architecture. We use three availability zones in each re region for fault tolerance, and we do three, three regions as well, uh, so that we both for fault tolerance and for latency purposes, and also for scale. And just to give you the larger picture, we're only talking so far about our cloud control plane. Our customers also need to navigate through their own home networks, through the internet, to our cloud control plane, but also to our CDN that actually does the video playback and audio playback. And at peak, that part of the service is serving petabytes of content at terabits per second. Or it's one of the world's largest CDNs at this point. In fact, in the United States, we're approaching 37% of last mile traffic to homes in the US. And we're not even at 50% market penetration yet. And then of course, just to round things out, we also have service partners like PSN and Xbox Live. And we have to work closely with them to make sure that our service is resilient as possible. 
So challenge number two, how do we sustain and improve quality in the face of this growing scale and complexity? And so this has led us, thinking about these two challenges, to our definition of operational excellence. And you can think of it as a tension, ultimately, boil it down to two fundamental concepts. The quality of the customer experience, which includes the reliability, the performance, the security, the functional correctness of that experience, and the velocity at which our engineering teams can move and deliver innovation out to those customers, because that's our competitive edge. You can see that when we're in the office, these are outages by day of week, we break things. You look at it by time of day, 9 o'clock in the morning, boom, let's start making changes to our production environment. Again, we break things. So we've created sort of a shorthand to talk about this relationship, and we call this the curve, the quality velocity curve. And the best way to think about it is to start with the most fundamental form of quality, which is the uptime of your service. Does it work or does it not work? And so on the left, on the y-axis, you see uptime expressed in nines of availability. You can see on the right-hand side the amount of time that you can be down in a given year in order to achieve that uptime. And you can see that there's sort of a sweet spot potentially between three and four nines where you've got either about nine hours per year that you can be down, seems reasonably achievable, and then at the top end potentially four nines, depending on your business, you may need even more than that. On the y-axis is a hypothetical rate of change. And so you can see that the, if you move along this curve, that if you want more availability, you're going to have to sacrifice your rate of change. We know that during the end of the year when we pretty much do a deployment freeze, our availability is great but we're not innovating and we're not making changes to our environment. If we want to move more quickly, then we might need to sacrifice some of those nines in order to achieve that high velocity innovation. And these are choices that you can make moving up and down this curve. But what we really want is we want to have our cake and we want to eat it too. We want to shift the entire curve up, so up to the right, so that we can get both of these things simultaneously. And so our definition about operational excellence is about eliminating that, that false dichotomy that there's a trade-off here and focusing on the union of these two things. Our, our definition is that it's the continuous improvement of the management, design, and function of operational environments to achieve greater quality, velocity, and competitive advantage. And when we talk about environments, we're not just talking about our production environment for our members. That's very important, but it's not the only environment that we care about. We also care about the environment that our engineers and developers are using, their development environment, the test environment, the tools that they use to get their jobs done every day. This is their shop floor. So now let's talk about operations engineering. This is the muscle that we put behind achieving operational excellence. And a little bit of context before I dive in, because the culture, the technical culture that you have really matters when you think about how you want to run these kinds of things and how you organize to accomplish operational excellence. And we have adopted the you build it, you run it methodology. And we like this because it really does align incentives quite well. If I'm a developer and I'm not putting enough time into the resiliency and the performance of my service, I'm the one who should get called when that service fails. Not somebody on some other team, hopefully not even my, my teammates, although that may happen, and you can be sure that they'll let you know uh, if you wrote some bad code. Um, so we do like this, and we like that incentive model, but at the same time, this can be a rather daunting task for engineers. There's a lot of things that they have to be good at. In addition to the things that you would normally think of from developers, designing and coding, they also need to be able to build their projects. They need to be able to bake an AMI and get it out into their test environment, execute automated tests against that, and then deploy into production. Running it means you have to operate it. And you have to know all of your configuration options so that you can make changes in real time if you need to. And you have to have a good monitoring and alerting strategy and dashboards and triaging skills and a whole wide variety of things to make sure that when your service fails, you can recover quickly. And of course, just to make things a little more interesting, we do have to do this globally. We've got those three availability zones. We're running in three regions. And so this is a pretty daunting task. Luckily. We also value the concept of undifferentiated heavy lifting. 
This is why we're in the cloud today, because we chose to rely on Amazon's infrastructure to be able to outsource a lot of the things that we didn't want to have to invest in. But we also do that internally with some centralized teams that support the rest of our engineering community and support the people who are working on product innovation. And so our definition of operations engineering is fairly straightforward. It's the application of software engineering practices and principles to achieve and sustain our definition of operational excellence. And this probably equates to things that are relatively obvious. Automation, things like continuous delivery. Building modular reusable components. Providing tools and services that simply lower the, the, the barrier for adoption for our engineering partners. And then there's best practices. We evangelize them, we support, we go and do consulting and direct engagement with those teams to help them adopt those best practices. And so I'm gonna go deep into operations engineering now and to talk about the three disciplines that we've created, both from an organizational perspective but also from a discipline perspective uh, to achieve operational excellence. And then how we can bring those together to maximize their leverage. We'll start with engineering tools, and I'm gonna to plagiarize a friend and colleague, Roy Rappaport, who likes to talk about our time in our data center as our artisanal past. When we lovingly handcrafted our environment, we racked and stacked our own servers, we configured hosts by hand, uh, and we had uh, a wide variety of interesting challenges because it was uh, not a well-structured, predictable environment. And it was very slow for us to be able to scale and innovate. And luckily, when we moved to the cloud, we really obviated a lot of those challenges. Uh, we now use base AMIs, which have a standardized configuration. We're using EC2 instances, so we know what hardware we're using. So we really moved forward and, and really moved the needle in a substantial way, and we received a lot of benefit from that. But what we didn't do right away was focus on the automation piece and delivery. And so still for years after we moved to the cloud, we were still doing those late night manual deployments uh, where people were sort of having to babysit certain processes. Oh, we don't want to deploy during peak, so we better do it two in the morning. We had repeated mistakes because humans make mistakes. And just because one person makes a mistake and learns from it doesn't mean that information automatically makes it to the other people who also need to know about that potential mistake. And of course, anybody who's been on one of those outage calls where you're waiting for a build to finish so you can deploy a fix to alleviate customer pain, that can be a rather painful process when it takes an hour or so to do. So our engineering tool space is really about addressing all of this. How do we accelerate the rate of change? How do we move away from these manual mistakes and late night deployments? And we do that by focusing on automation, productivity, the velocity of engineers, their ability to get things done quickly and deploy quickly, and do that with confidence. And so we've created a new tool called Spinnaker. It does a number of things. First of all, it's the next generation platform that we're using that replaces Asgard, which has gotten us very far and has a cloud management console, but we needed one more global and more sophisticated. It's our delivery engine that applies a number of different strategies for doing deployments, like rolling pushes, red-black deployments, where you leave your old cluster around. You deploy the new one and you can fall back quickly if you need to. And it's also a more general automation platform. It's a pluggable environment. And so we can pretty much automate anything we want. And when you're running in the cloud, if you call APIs, it means you can also execute virtually anything you want within that environment. We don't want it to be a kitchen sink. It's focused on delivery, but it's extremely flexible. This is what the, uh, one of the Spinnaker screens look like for a service we call NCCP. It's one of our critical edge services. And at a glance, we can look at all the instances across three, three regions and see their health, click on an individual instance and look at the information about that instance. And so it allows us to sort of seamlessly manage this at a more global scale. What's really exciting though is the automation piece, our delivery pipelines, where we can create arbitrary sequences of steps with tests and bailouts in case something goes wrong. And then we can do that globally. This is an example of a workflow it's a part of the overall pipeline, but you can go and find a build. You can run what we call a canary, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but essentially you're running some live code with a small sample of live traffic. You can make a decision at that point, whether human or automated, and then you can deploy globally. 
And again, you might not want to do that all at once, but you could. If you do it all at once, you run the risk of deploying some new code globally that ends up breaking. And then you end up having a global outage and no place to go. But this is a great tool for us in terms of moving forward. And we're, our teams have been embrace, embracing this aggressively. About 80% of our jobs, our delivery jobs, are now running through this platform. Now, it's important to note that Spinnaker is part of a larger strategy which we call the paved road. And the paved road is really just best of breed technologies that we have chosen to support so that our customers don't have to go off and try to figure out how to do these on their own. We don't support everything, so we try to pick the best tools that affect that give us leverage for the most number of internal customers. So we use Stash for source control. We use Gradle for our builds, and we've seen dramatic improvements using Gradle in our build times. We use Ubuntu for our Linux distribution, and we've done some kernel tunings that have given us some, some much better performance and efficiency. We use Jenkins for continuous integration, and then Spinnaker sort of wraps around all of that as our orchestration engine for delivery. So that's engineering tools. Now I'm going to move on and talk about insight and real-time analytics. When we talk about this space, we talk about the OODA loop. And for those of you that are not familiar with it, it stands for observe, orient, decide, act. Colonel John Boyd, who was a World War II fighter pilot, observed that, they, that the fighter pilots who were in dogfights, who could iterate through this loop, who could observe their environment, get quickly oriented and determine who's friend or foe and where are they, make a decision and act, were the ones who went home. Now, you could argue that an outage of Netflix, where a streaming service is not life or death like a dogfight. But sometimes your customers might think that it is. <laughs> this is poor Megan. She posted this back in February. We had an outage. Netflix is down. I feel like my best friend just died. I, I love this because it means that um, she thinks of this as an essential part of her life, and we all want our customers to think about our service that way, that they can't live without it, even though they really probably could. <laughs> so we started by focusing on how do we alleviate Megan's pain? How do we detect these problems as quickly as possible using real-time analytics? And we started by focusing on anomaly detection, essentially aberrations over time, typically by looking at time series data. And we use an algorithm called double exponential smoothing to try to predict what should be happening and then compare it to what's actually happening. And it basically predicts the future based on history, but favors the most recent history. So you can see the blue line, which is actual traffic, and you can see the red line, which is the following line of the double exponential smoothing algorithm. And then you can look at the gaps and look at the, the, the reality of the situation and set some kind of threshold, and then you can alert. Now, this works reasonably well. It was a good first stab. Unfortunately, because of the infrastructure we were using, the time delay was about six to eight minutes, and we decided that we could do better. So we started focusing on real-time streaming, much shorter time windows, and a much more granular view of the world. And instead of using time series and DES, we decided to start investing in ensemble machine learning. So this is an example where we've got multiple algorithms running against the same time series data. And then you let them vote to determine whether or not something is true or not. Here's an example of four different algorithms applied to the exact same time series data. And you can see there are similarities, but they're not all exactly the same. But when you actually combine them together, they can vote and say, hey, that thing over there, that really is an outage. And we've managed to get this down from six to eight minutes down to less than a minute. We think we're going to be able to get it down to something like 30 seconds. Now, this is all great, but all we did was just fire off an alert. So it is a closed OODA loop. We did observe, orient, decide, and act, and the action was to fire off alert. Unfortunately, now our developers need to start that whole process all over again. Now they're getting on a call, they're looking at their dashboards, they're doing triage, they're observing what's going on in the environment, and they're orienting. And then they have to decide what to do, and they have to act. And we all know that when you get humans involved, we're frequently slower than machines if you know exactly what you should be doing in a particular situation. And so we asked ourselves the question, how do we take humans out of the equation altogether? And one way that we've done that is outlier detection. And unlike anomaly detection, which is about a time series, 
This is about a particular point in time and looking for outliers within that point in time. You can see here, this is one of our clusters from one of our auto-scaling groups. You can see a couple of clear offenders here that are outliers from the, the normal cluster. And we've built automation around it so that when we discover this kind of thing, we can take a number of actions, including killing them off and letting the auto-scaling me mechanism simply replace those instances. We do this using a technology called Kepler, which uses unsupervised machine learning algorithms. We prefer those, because we'd rather not have humans in the loop if possible. And we use a density-based clustering algorithm called dbscan, which essentially just looks for clumps, and then looks for things that are not in those clumps or those clusters. And then it's able to make a decision that something is or is not an outlier. And then we can take really any arbitrary action. Today, these are the actions we can take. Email, page, take something out of service, detach from an ELB, or just terminate the instance. But that's all about fixing things that are already broken in our environment. What if we could catch things just a little bit sooner? And we have this concept of a canary in Netflix. And what a canary is, is a new version of our code that we put in the production path, but only take a small sample of traffic. And then we can compare that to the existing code base and the metrics coming in from that. And then if the new version is as good or better than the previous one, we simply cut the traffic over and start routing it through. The algorithm here is actually fairly straightforward. It's not as sophisticated as some of the machine learning algorithms we've got, but it's been very effective for us. We define a set of metrics for the application that we care about. We set thresholds for what's good and what's bad. And every few minutes, we go and look at the data points from both the old and new code base, and we classify them. And then we compute the score. So we look at the medians. We look at the ratios between those medians from old and new code. And then we determine whether or not there's enough votes of confidence to be able to move forward or not. So all of these together, anomaly and outlier detection and all the things that we've talked about, are coming together into a set of functionality and a vision for where we want to go in the future. And thinking globally, as we expand across the world, we can't have humans looking at every country and every ASN and every cache that might have an issue or every service. So we have to get better at doing this automatically. And so our goal is to systematically observe every facet in our ecosystem and look at interesting permutations of those and then detect brokenness. Know what's normal and notice deviations from normal. We prefer, again, to use the unsupervised monitoring and decision making to accomplish that. And we also will apply automation around auto-tuning for various settings and automated recovery. And if we do need to get humans involved, let's give them as much information as possible to figure out what's going on and iterate through that OODA loop as quickly as possible so they can alleviate customer pain and Megan can get back to spending time with her best friend. So that's the insight space, and now let's talk about performance and reliability. And the big focus for performance and reliability, it's a vast space, and there's a lot of interesting things that happen in that space, but the way that I think about it is, it's about finding that weakest link that thing that's going to break and take down your entire service. So this again is our Netflix ecosystem or our Netflix microservice architecture. I've named a few of the services there. We've got our front door service we call Zool. This is our proxy layer. It can do all kinds of interesting things, dynamic routing. It helps us do those canary processes that we were talking about. We've got our two primary edge services. One's called NCCP and one is called API. And they depend on this vast network of other services to fulfill requests from our devices and from our customers. Now, we've talked before about using the analogy of an organ system. And imagine that one of your services, like an organ, starts to fail. And in some cases, that can cause a cascading failure that takes out your entire region, or if you made the mistake of deploying that code globally all at once before you discovered whether it was good code you could take out your entire global service. So to address this, we've recently clearly defined a discipline that we now call chaos engineering. I'm gonna give you another definition. It's the discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in order to build confidence in its capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. That last part makes people a little nervous sometimes, but it's really important. The way that I think about it is like an inoculation. If you're thinking about a living organism, inoculations are essentially a dead version of a virus or a weaker form of something. 
that makes you resilient to the actual threat. And likewise, our poster child for chaos has taught us that this is a really valuable thing. For those of you who may not be familiar with Chaos Monkey, I suppose there might be a few. Uh, the analogy here is imagine you've got a monkey running around in your data center, he's pulling out cables, he's smashing your boxes together, and you still need to be resilient in the face of that. Now he's actually a little better behaved than that. We let him run during business hours, and he's not allowed to take too many instances out at one time. You have to be a little bit sane about it. But it has been extremely effective for us. And we have not only done this for our stateless instances, but we've also done it for our stateful instances. So last year, for those of you who may recall, there was a major update to the Zen hypervisor that needed to be done in September. It happened to overlap with our celebration of 50 million members down in LA over the very same weekend. We weren't thrilled about that when we heard about the timing around it, um, but we were reasonably confident that we would survive. And of the 2,700 Cassandra nodes that we had, 218 needed to be rebooted. And 22 didn't actually come back automatically, and we had to rely on automation to recover from that. And we never would have built that automation if we weren't using Chaos Monkey and had it keeping us honest the whole time. And the upshot was that we had a great weekend. We had our great 50 million celebration party. It was a lot of fun. And our customers didn't notice anything at all. There was absolutely no interruption in service. So it's a great story. And if you take nothing away from this talk today, think about starting with something like Chaos Monkey. Now, we didn't stop there. And we decided, well, let's start looking at the next kind of blast radius or thing that's, that could fail. Let's look at services. What about a microservice within your infrastructure? What happens when you take that out? And that's a little bit scarier. So we built this system that allows us to sort of ramp up confidence so we're not just shooting things in production and crossing our fingers. And this is called FIT, or the Fault Injection Test Framework. And the way that it works is we can do a number of things with it. We can simulate by overriding an individual device or an individual customer account, and simulate a single service being unavailable as it navigates its, as that request from that device navigate through our call stack. And the nice thing about it is it's integrated into Ribbon, which is our IPC layer, so that that information passes all the way through. No matter how you call that service for that particular override, you're going to get that service B, in this case, is unavailable. And then once we've determined that that works functionally, then we're willing to take the risk on trying this out in production. It obviously can't be a service that is so critical to your service that you're dead in the water. But there are many services or microservices that provide functionality that you can survive without. And those are the ones that we focus on. So that's been a huge benefit. And we've really seen some big wins there. We've discovered vulnerabilities to our microservices at the service layer. But then we still weren't satisfied with that. What about globally? What about at the region level? What if a region fails? And we did see back in December 2012, there was an outage, and we had no place to go. And that inspired us to think about going to a multi-region strategy. This is a tool that we built recently called Flux. It allows us to visualize traffic flows. In the center, you can see the traffic coming in from the internet globally. And we generally direct traffic to individual regions using DNS, usually geo-routed. We're experimenting with latency-based as well. And then if a customer happens to go to a region where we think they should actually have gone someplace else, we use our Zool proxy layer to actually send that customer and proxy back to the correct region and then serve the response back through the proxy. So let's do a little simulation here. This is a simulation of a failure in a particular region. Imagine that we just deployed some bad code out to US West 2, which is in the upper left-hand corner. And you can see it's starting to fail. You'll see an increase in the red dots. We do sampling here so we can represent failure rates and we can visualize them well. And we've got our hundreds of thousands of requests coming in. Globally, you can see even our error rate there is starting to spike because a subset, one region, is failing. Now we've just basically turned on our Zool proxy and said, start warming up and sending traffic over to a healthy region where we can serve those customers. And then once that's fully warmed up, we can cut over DNS and start routing all of our customers over to the healthy region. You can see that happening here. Now, of course, our engineers are furiously working on US West 2 at this point. Luckily, the error rate's down. The pressure has come off a little bit because our customers are having a good experience now. They're no longer suffering. 
And then once we've got that in good shape, we can start, we will flip DNS back over to what was the unhealthy region, let it warm up a bit, and we're still gonna use the Zool proxy to make sure that we don't overload that region while we're scaling up. Usually we kept things pinned high, and now we're back in a healthy state. So this has been extremely powerful for us. We actually simulate this exercise. Thank you. <laughs> so we do an exercise like this. We call them Chaos Kong exercises, about monthly. And we're evolving that technology to be able to do it in a more and more automated way. And ultimately, we're going to get to a point where we can not only just fail over from one region to another, we're very close to being able to fail over from one region to many, which has great efficiencies for us in terms of reserve capacity, spreading the load, and again, guaranteeing that our customers have a great experience. Now, just like the paved road, we have another wrapping strategy where we call production ready. And this is essentially all of the best practices and technologies and approaches that we recommend that our service microservice owners adopt in order to have a resilient service. And you can see that chaos participation is one aspect of that larger picture. You also need to have a great alerting and monitoring strategy. The red-black deployment I mentioned earlier is considered a best practice if you're able to do that. Squeeze testing so that you can detect performance drift over time, which also can affect your reliability. So we've covered the three disciplines. Now let's sort of start putting the pieces together. Let's figure out how do we maximize these to the best effect. One way that we do that is by thinking about it, the tools layer. We build a lot of internal tools, uh, and we open source them, as probably many of you know. And we've started to think about our operational tools as if they were a single product, with a common user interface, common CSS. We're investing in web components. And we're linking them together so that as our engineers need to troubleshoot or manage different things, they're as efficient as possible. Let me give you a quick example of that. So this is a cluster that has a couple of bad instances marked in red. You can see this one here. And you can look quickly and see it on the right-hand side the instance data that we're having problems with our ELB health check. And maybe this has been a problem that we've had many times before, so we want to dig in. We could go and just take action, but then that just solves the problem right away. But what if we actually want to dig in and do some analysis? So we've started integrating deep links to our other tools so that we can do that analysis. In this case, jumping right into our dashboards interface for that particular instance, looking at systems metrics so we can start diagnosing the problem. Now, where it gets really interesting is when you do this at the infrastructure level. When you think about the deep integration of your modular components, we're building a lot of infrastructure to be more resilient. And of course, you do think of Spinnaker, which is our continuous delivery platform, as something that's delivering things out into the world. Continuous delivery is a pretty well-known thing. And functional tests are usually the first thing that you think about when you think about continuous delivery. Let's make sure my code works in a functionally correct way before I deploy. But we can also integrate that production-ready checklist, those technologies that make us more resilient directly into the pipeline. And that might include our automated canary analysis, conformity checks to make sure that everything is uniform in your environment and doesn't create aberrations that create challenges for your engineers. Or chaos exercises. We're talking about integrating fit as a step in the continuous delivery pipeline to make sure that your service, when you deploy new code, has appropriate fallbacks and properly tuned timeouts and all of those things before you start exposing it to a large number of customers. And then we have our performance tool that we've written internally called Citrus, and we plan on integrating that into Spinnaker as well, so as you're deploying your code every time, you can be benchmarking and determine whether or not your performance has started to drift. And of course, none of this would work in an automated way without the operational insight, without the ability to do automated decision making to allow the next step in the process to either move forward or for you to choose to abort because you just ran into a significant problem. And luckily, you programmatically detected it, and now you can have people get involved and troubleshoot the issue. So we've applied this approach very broadly to our production-ready checklist. We're doing more and more automated tuning of things like alerts, Tomcat configurations, auto-scaling configuration, and we're using machine learning in some cases or simpler algorithms to approach that. 
We're doing more and more real-time analytics decision support, as we've already discussed, for automated canary analysis, for squeeze testing, so we know if we squeeze too much, and even for flow, which is our tool that we use to automate our multi-region traffic management. And so we also need to know if we're moving too quickly, if we need to back off, those kinds of things. Conformity checks can be built right in, and they can be standalone or within uh, the Spinnaker pipelines. And of course, we talked about the delivery integration previously. So here's the outcome of all of this work. This is a uh, exponential moving average of Netflix's uptime over the last four years. And you can see that huge spike there. That was the 2012 Christmas Eve outage. Um, not very much fun. And you can see that, that as a percentage, it was a fairly dramatic impact on us that inspired us to build our active active infrastructure. Now, what's interesting to me is we made some progress. Uh, and we've done, made some improvements. But we still, for years, continued to see this sawtooth of regular outages that was creating a little bit of pain for our customers, pain for our engineers, affected productivity. But if you look in the last year, we've started to achieve kind of a step function here. And if we drill down into that time period, you can see that we had these, this regular sawtooth last year. When we started really digging in around the summer going, OK, it's time to really get serious here and start applying these best practices in a really rigorous way. And over the last, over about a six month period, it was a bit of a slog. We systematically went through and did chaos exercises with all of the most critical services, engaged with those teams, and they did a lot of work on their own as well. We have a great edge team that has worked closely with us, working with their partners, so that we can create a really resilient service. And you can see right here, this is where the tipping point started to happen. Now, of course, I want to knock wood every time I say this, that, hey, we're in a better place right now. But it looks like we may be in a sustained place, and we're continuing to push very hard on the adoption of continuous delivery and the automation of best practices, reducing the overhead for our engineers so that they're able to focus on product work but still provide an amazing experience to our customers and also have a highly reliable experience. So this is the sort of end of our journey. And I want to recap for you a little bit. We talked about large scale distributed systems being a pretty challenging thing and similar to a living organism with so much complexity that it's virtually impossible to understand and manage this for humans to do that work. And of course, we're continually innovating and so we're constantly pushing new changes into the system in addition to just the operational changes we do every day. We talk about shifting the curve, the quality and velocity curve, as the strategy, the orientation that we have to achieve operational excellence. And we've applied operations engineering as one of several strategies at Netflix in order to provide an amazing, reliable experience to our customers and high velocity for our engineers. If you're interested in digging in further on all of this, please visit the Netflix OSS site. A lot of the technologies and techniques we've talked about are captured there. It's worth noting that Spinnaker has not yet been open sourced. We did announce that we're going to be doing that in some number of months. And the best way to find out about that is to watch the Netflix tech blog. We've had a few interesting uh, posts the Chaos Engineering Upgraded will talk about how we've recently defined uh, Chaos Engineering as a discipline and defined principles around that. We recently uh, open source Vector, which is our on-device performance monitoring tool starting to get a lot of traction in the industry. We've also posted on outlier detection, and we open sourced Atlas, portions of our Atlas infrastructure recently, relatively recently as well. So you can stay in touch with us along these lines by walking, watching the tech blog. If this was useful to you and you want to hear more about more nuanced things about the various things that we've discussed today, we actually have a total of eight talks here at reInvent. We have Andrew Park from our FP&A department talking about cost efficiency, but how do we do that in a really agile way without getting in the way of our engineers? Uh, we have Peter Bacchus who's going to talk about data streams how we take our logging data, 8 million events per second, and run it through our infrastructure. That should be a pretty interesting talk as well. And Dave Hahn, who's on my team, will be talking about a day in the life of an engineer using 37% of the internet. 
So it's more of a boots on the ground, lower level discussion with a lot of detail about how do we do this on a day-to-day -day basis. Coburn Watson is gonna be talking about availability and innovation, a similar theme to what we've discussed today. And Roy Rappaport and Chris Sandin, also within the operations engineering team, will be talking about some of these self-healing techniques in a lot more detail than what I've discussed today. We have Daniel Weeks and Eva Say, who are gonna be talking about Spark and Presto and how we use that with our big data platform. And we have Jason Chan talking about compliance and agility. Um, he's our director of security. All of these are interesting talks. I recommend that you check them out. And with that, I will say thank you.